What's up everyone, I'm back again for another video. And today, as you saw in the title, I'm going to be ranking the Percy Jackson books. Now Percy Jackson is a series that's actually really dear to me because I think it's the, like the first series that I actually enjoyed reading. It's a series that I discovered when I was um, pretty young since it started in 2005 and I think it's kind of weird because the first book I actually read was The Lost Hero and then my brother told me oh, there's another series that goes um, kind of like a prequel series even though it was written before but it's kind of a series that goes before this that gives a lot of backstory about what's happening in The Lost Hero and in the books following The Lost Hero which are in the Heroes of Olympus series by the way. Yeah so after I read The Lost Hero out of order um, I went back and read the Percy Jackson series and ever since then it's been one of my favorite series so we're going to rank the books. Now by no means am I saying that I have a favorite book and I like hate the book on the bottom. I love all these books but there are certain elements that make some of the books more great in my eyes and less great in my eyes uh, but they are all really awesome so I just wanted to make that clear real quick. Alright so coming in at number five and it really pains my heart to do this. But coming in at number five is the third book in the trilogy. But coming in at number five is the fifth book in, but coming in at number five is the third book in the five book series, which is The Titan's Curse. Now, once again, by no means am I saying I hate this book. I actually love this book. But in terms of all the other books on the list, it does come in last, and I'll tell you one big reason why. I mean, the main plot line of this book is that Percy is not included in the quest. So that's the first thing that I don't like about this. He's not included in the quest, and he has to kind of stow away on Blackjack to follow the real questers. And then eventually he is, like, adopted onto the quest team, and then they go on the quest. But one of the main plot lines of the book is that Annabeth has been kidnapped, which effectively means she's gone from most of the book. Now, I don't know about you guys, but I know that the Percy Jackson series is literally, there's three main characters. Percy Jackson, Grover Underwood, and Annabeth Chase. I mean, those are the main three characters. And so when you take one of those characters away, you, I mean, the story just isn't as good. And that's what Rick Riordan did with this book. He just took one of the characters away and basically had that be the driving force for the plot. So I guess it kind of worked that way. But having one of the characters gone for the almost the entirety of the book just didn't work as well. And um, that's the main reason that it sets it back to number five. Now coming up at number four, we have the second book in the series, The Sea of Monsters. Now this is actually the only book of the series that I own a hard copy of. It's a paperback copy, but you know, it's a physical copy. I got it for free somewhere, so I didn't even buy it. It's the only book of the series that I own. And once again, this is not a bad book, but it's just, I think the, I think the storyline could have been stronger, definitely. I think the idea of going to the Sea of Monsters on a quest is a really great idea. I mean, I guess it's also known as the Mediterranean, I believe, that's the Sea of Monsters. Um, it's a really great idea. But Grover in a wedding dress, come on, come on. Show the picture from the movie? Yeah, exactly. The book starts out with Percy having a dream of Grover running through the streets of somewhere and then he runs into a bridal shop and he's running from the Cyclops which is what we figure out later but he runs to a bridal shop and that's where he gets the dress that he's seen in later in the book but come on Grover why you gotta wear a wedding dress and obviously at the beginning of the book um, after the dream that Percy has Percy is very 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 coincidentally in the same school as a Cyclops that turns out to be his half-brother. I guess all Cyclopes, Cyclopes, whatever, are his half-brothers, but come on. He just happens to be in the same school as his half-brother. That just seems really convenient to me, and definitely sets it back because of the fact that he's with his half-brother, and then, like, he can conveniently, once again, go to Camp Half-Blood, bring his brother with him, and, uh, like, adopt him into the camp, and make him part of the camp. It just seems really uh, shoddily done, once again, really convenient like it wouldn't happen in real life. The story is still great. I do think it could have been a little bit better in areas, but the humor is great, uh, the characters are great, Annabeth isn't gone the whole time, which is great. And so those are the reasons that this book is at number four for me. Now bringing it into the top three is book four, The Battle of the Labyrinth. 
I do really enjoy this book once again. <laughs> I feel like I got to say that about all these books, but I really enjoyed this book. The reason it comes in at number three is just simply because I don't think it's as strong as number one and number five, which are coming up next on the list. You're gonna have to wait and see which one is at number one. But number one and five obviously are at the top of my list in, in the number in the top two spots. But number four, the fourth book in a series is never gonna be as good as the fifth book if the fifth book is the ending book. That I mean the fifth book is the be all end all. It has everything that you want, everything that needs to happen, and so it just can't measure up. And the same goes for the first book. The first book is always amazing in the series because it's what gets the series started. And without that book, you couldn't have the series. So uh, the Battle of Labyrinth, I don't really want to say anything that I hate about it because I really don't hate anything about it. Basically all the stuff that happens in it is amazing. You got Chris Rodriguez going insane. You got uh, Rachel Elizabeth there making a, a second appearance from the Titans Curse uh, to the Battle of Labyrinth. You got Percy Jackson killing cheerleaders. It's just overall great. How can you not love a book when a demigod kills cheerleaders? And especially the ending sequence when all of the monsters and Luke's army storm out of the labyrinth into Camp Half Blood and attack them. But then Grover does that crazy uh, pan yell. <coughs> and Percy like shoots some water at a tree and Nico says, serve me. And some skeletons rise up from the ground and kill some monsters. That's just great. Um, and that's the reason that, that I elevated it on my list to number three, but well, I can't beat the first and the fifth. So that's why I counted in at number three. Now coming in at number two, is book one, The Lightning Thief. Guys, I'm really sorry, I just can't put the original in the number one spot. The original is really, really great. It obviously tells Percy's origin story. It uh, has a quest, has the first quest we've ever seen in Percy Jackson's world. Percy is the leader of the quest, and he uh, takes them all over the country. The St. Louis Arch, that water park where Annabeth and Percy are in a boat together and would have been a great opportunity for them to ignite their love with each other. That was weird. That was weird. And a lot of other places I don't remember. It's just a really, really, really good book. A really great origin story. And the ending is amazing too. So it ends really well with him just going home and then uh, us knowing that there's going to be another book to keep the story alive and keep going. One of the things I found really great about the story also is the backstories. I mean, you know everything about Percy, Annabeth, and Grover, who are the three main characters, like I've said before. Uh, you know everything about them from this book. There's so many different ways that Riordan tells the backstories of these three characters that you're just like, wow, like, I understand these characters so well, and I can follow them, and I adore them. That's another one of the reasons that it elevated this book to number two. And yeah, so that book is number two on my list, and obviously, We've come down to the final book in the series, which is number one, and that is The Last Olympian. Obviously, The Last Olympian is book five in the series, but it comes in number one on my list because Ethan Nakamura makes a return uh, to do the right thing in the end from the Battle of the Labyrinth when he kind of betrays Percy. Uh, Percy saves him from the arena of Antaeus, I believe, and uh, Ethan runs away with them, but then Ethan just leaves them and he goes back to Cronus' army. But in this book, he makes the right decision and attacks Cronus only to have Cronus kill him. So that was kind of, that was kind of anticlimactic. But still, it was just great seeing the Ethan, Ethan Eckman return to the right side. And also, one person that I haven't mentioned in this whole series, in this whole series review, is Luke Castellan. Uh, obviously, it calls back to him in all of the, all of the books beforehand. And he also, turns against Cronus and makes the right decision to kill himself, which in effect kills Cronus. He stabs himself right here in the armpit, kills Cronus, and uh, he makes the right decision to do that. Percy couldn't have won without that, obviously. Percy is, Percy is the Percy is the like bearer of the Great Prophecy, and without Luke. Uh, Luke was actually mentioned in the Great Prophecy when Percy thought it was him being mentioned. Uh, but without Luke, he could not have done what he did and saved Olympus, so that was great that Luke turned back to the right side. Also, what's great about this book is that the Battle of Manhattan is just, like, amazing. There's a bunch of separate battles that go on in the midst of it, but just the Battle of Manhattan, I think, is a great story, especially since you've had a quest in each of the previous four books, and now, for the fifth book, there's no quest. You're just going to Manhattan, which is not that far away from Long Island, which is where the demigod training camp is, Camp Half-Blood. And you're just going to Manhattan to fight some armies, you know, 
kill some monsters, eat some buffet from a hotel, you know, everyday stuff. It's just a really great concept for a story, and it's a really great way to end out the series. I can't help but love the way that Rick Riordan crafted this series to end on this really high note. And also, he crafted it so that it would lead into the Heroes of Olympus series, and he did that mostly in the last Olympian book. He just put all these just put all these Easter eggs into it about the upcoming Heroes of Olympus series. A really great book to me and a really great ending to the series as a whole. So yeah, those are my five books in the order that I love them once again. I love them all so much, but there is an order that they go in and that was it. So I hope you enjoyed the video. If you want to see any more like this, um, Rick Riordan books or um, yeah, basically Rick Riordan books. If you want to see any more rankings like this, definitely let me know because I'd love to do them. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you next time. How can you not love a book when a demigod kills cheerleaders? When a demigod kills cheerleaders. Kills cheerleaders. Kills cheerleaders.